So 9-11, um, I was uh, joined by my good friend at the time. He was uh, one of my supervisors, Bill Van Skoyek. He was our training officer at Morgan Stanley. I was a trainee. I, I wanted to go into the military. Uh, unfortunately, my, uh, my single mother, we, we had a, a, a bet. If I got into one institution, local institution, which was University of Miami, if I got into UM, I would go to UM. If I didn't, then she would give me the green light to go to the Marines. I wanted so bad not to go to UM. <laughs> Um, got, got accepted to UM. That was uh, the first um, life-changing event. Second was when I was at, at UM, and I'll get into that day, when I was at UM, I had this fascination about becoming an attorney, right? Because for me, it, it really felt like you were reaching, it was that, that stretch assignment for me personally. So, I, um, very fortunate to land an, an internship at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter back in 1999. Fell in love with the industry at the time, the technology bubble. Then from there, um, started law school. Went to law school, absolutely loved it. But I kept getting a call from Morgan Stanley that they wanted me to go into their training program. Went into the training program and flew up to New York. And the second day of, of training, the accident happened, terrorist attack. I was outside on a break. Our first session on Tuesday morning was um, from 7.30 to 7.45, and it ended at 8.40, so they gave us a 20-minute break. The instructions uh, were do not leave the premise because you cannot be late. If you're late, you will be dismissed immediately. So what did I do? Took the elevator, went downstairs, went for a break because I wanted to see New York City. It was my first time in the city. I was so excited with a couple of friends. Um, at, at the time that it happened, we had someone walking across the street and uh, with a book bag and he screamed out. He said, get back inside the building, get back inside the building. And there was confusion. And all of a sudden, we started to see a ton of debris falling on, uh, on top of us. So we, we went back into the World Trade Center. I was in uh, World Trade Center 2. Half of us were going in one way. Half of us were going into the other on the uh, turning doors. And we couldn't get in. And I just remember looking back, and a part of the building or an airplane just completely smashed a cab across the street. I knew there was a problem. So the person that was in front of us was trying to get in and we couldn't get in, started smashing the glass, finally got in, and no one knew what was happening because a plane could not fly close to those buildings back then. Got inside, all my belongings were upstairs on the 64th floor. So I headed to security, to go up and I said, I think there's an issue, there, there, there was an accident, something happened outside. And she said, there was an accident in World Trade Center 1, World Trade Center uh, 2 is secure and you can return to your office. I was about to go upstairs, my roommate at the time, which saved my life, pulled me aside and said, I don't want you to go up there, I don't think it's safe. I said, all my belongings are up there, I'll be right back, I promise starting to, to head into the elevator banks. He grabs me and he says, I'll let you go up, but I want you to say a prayer with me. Okay, I'll say a prayer. After that prayer, I don't know what happened, but I had this sense of calmness and I wanted to stay exactly where I was. So, he saved my life because I would have been riding the, uh, the elevator bank on the way up while the second plane would have gone through World Trade Center 2. Um, again, there was mass confusion. We didn't know what was going on. And after a couple of moments after that, um, we started seeing people evacuating, and we decided to start walking 
kind of walking towards the exit, and then we started to see a lot of folks evacuating, and that's when we uh, decided to, to start running. And then as we were hitting the doors to exit the building, that's when the second plane went through the tower, the second tower. It ran, ran outside, looked up, and I saw both towers on fire. So where do you, from there, as you said, you started running, not really knowing what was going on, hearing a lot of noise, people I assume were screaming. Where'd you run to? What happened at that point? What happened then? So I, I, I looked up, saw both towers on fire, engulfed. I was confused. Um, it looked like something out of a movie, it really did. Ran across the street, and I remember looking up, I just wanted to observe the whole thing. And um, for those of you that have seen some of the footage, I'm sure you have, it looked like it was snowing in September. And that was all the paper that was within those two towers. Mm -hmm. And you looked up and it looked like it was snowing in the middle of the day. Um, there was a work van across the street. AM radio was all the way up and um, started reporting that there was uh, two planes went through the, uh, the World Trade Center, uh, WTC1 and WTC2, and uh, that it was a terrorist attack. I don't think any of us can really imagine that, the feeling, a, a combination of, of, of fear, of course, and, and wonder, like, what in the world? It's like science fiction. Right. Um, like I said, I can't imagine yeah. feeling at all. Billy, you, uh, you worked, I, I think you worked fairly closely with, with Rick Rascola. Uh, he was... Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly his role, uh, other than what I've read about it. Certainly, I didn't know Rick. Uh, uh, but you were the com you are now the complex manager at Morgan Stanley in Miami. But at that time, you had uh, been to at the World Trade Center about a year, as I understand. Ironically enough, uh, well, first of all, I want to start by saying, and I need a bigger round of applause. God bless all of you for what you do. You are the future, as the prior panel said. And I want you to know, on behalf of myself and my family, we have nothing but love and admiration for all of you. So please give yourself a round of applause and thank you every day for what you do. All right, that's better. Now, I can't speak Spanish like Gio can, so I can barely speak English. So just bear with and me I a little bit here. I can't wear the three-piece suit. But exactly. <laughs> But um, let me give you a little, let me try to contextualize it a little bit for you, give you some background. So um, I'm from Yonkers, New York. Okay, it's part of Westchester County. Uh, I myself come from a family that, that was based and centered in the military. Uh, my father spent four years in the Navy, don't give up the ship. And my father was in Nagasaki a week after they dropped the bomb on a destroyer. And the old joke is, well, that's why your kids came out the way they did, because he was, ex <laughs> he was, he was exposed to a lot of radiation. But he was there. I had an uncle who uh, actually was a bombardier pilot, bunkmate with uh, Clark Gable. Okay, if you uh, probably too young to remember him, maybe some of us in here do. But he was a famous actor back then. And uh, my uncle was a bombardier pilot that was unfortunately killed in the B-52 that was scheduled to take him to his plane. So they subsequently named an American Legion post after him. It's the Ernest Pasqua Post, 1506. Uh, it's now located in Armonk, New York. So. Uh, coming from a family that had strong roots in the military. Uh, again, all my respect, admiration, and love for all of you for what you do. Um, I had started, uh, again, similar to Geo. Uh, I wanted to go to the Marines like you couldn't believe, uh, particularly coming from a family, again, that was centered in the military. But, you know, there was one thing that prevented me from going into service, and that was a crying mother. And she did not want me to go in. Um, so I chose a different path. I was like, okay, I'm going to become a police officer. Uh, so I'd taken the police exam, gotten a 90 on it, probably the best grade I've ever gotten. And uh, they put me in zone one, so I'm all ready to hire. And then they had a hiring freeze. So as I'm delivering pizza and parking cars and trying to find something to do with my life for a year and a half, a friend of mine that was in this business said, you know, you should really go into this business. You have the personality for it. It's great. It's a people business. You'll enjoy it. So took his advice, uh, interviewed with a few firms, ended up at Dean Witter, started working. Worked in White Plains, New York. I guess I did a good job. I passed the exams. They decided they wanted to send me to Manhattan to become a training manager. 
to run a class. So what a training manager did is essentially there were eight of us in the firm. All of the folks that passed their examinations to qualify to become a registered financial advisor were brought in to New York for a three-week training program. So Gio was part of that class. And I just want you to kind of envision this. We had folks from Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota. I mean, New York City is a pretty scary place for New Yorkers, let alone folks that are there. So this was day two of a three-week program with a lot of folks from out of town. Now, as fate would have it, it was the largest class that we ever had. There's 276 individuals in there. And yours truly was the manager that was in charge of this. So um, as we begin to get through the day, um, you know, we started 15 minutes early, and I'll come back to this, thankfully, because the first speaker that came in came in a little bit early. And once he was done, we put everybody on an extended break, okay, a 30-minute break. So we sent them downstairs, and I go back to sit in my office, and someone comes over and says, you know, I think something happened at one of the other buildings because I see stuff outside. And I go, what are you talking about? So I, I walk over, and I look, and being a baseball fan, you know, I was fortunate to be there when the Yankees beat the Mets back in 2000. And they had a ticker tape parade there. And the ticker tape parade was beautiful because you saw all paper and everything flying around outside. Well, this looked like the ticker tape parade from hell because everything was on fire and flying around outside. So I had no idea what was going on. But I went back into the room, called as many people as I could back into the room, and tried to get some level of organization. And a couple of minutes go by, and all I thought was, I don't really know what happened here, but I do remember what Rick Rescorla taught us. Something happens in this building, do not hesitate, leave. Open up the stairwells, send people down. Rick, beat this into your head. I don't, I suffer from, you're not the only generation that has ADD, HDD, and every other form of DD, okay? My attention span is very limited, but I will tell you, when Rick Rescorla ran a training, you paid attention, because his voice was so loud and so commanding, and you immediately had respect for him, and the training that I went through with him saved my life, because I listened to what he said, and I did not hesitate. I said, we're out of here. Let's go, we can regroup downstairs, figure it out. We no sooner did that, opened up the stairwell, got everybody down, got them all out. We get to about the 50th floor, the Port Authority, which really ran the buildings, came across and said, building one was hit by an aircraft, building two is secure, go back to your desks. Now, I'm gonna give credit to Rick, because again, all I can hear is that loud, resounding voice in my head, from the four or five training courses that I had with them. But I also said, you know, I saw The Towering Inferno as a kid, and great movie if you haven't seen it. But smoke will eventually harm and kill you. And I don't know what's going on in this building, but the other building's pretty close to us, and there's a lot of smoke and stuff. I'm out of here. I told the people I was with, let's just continue to go. I don't feel comfortable with, with going back. About 30 seconds after that, we got hit. Now, if you worked in that building, you knew when you went to the bathroom, the building would kind of sway a little bit with the wind. It was built to flex. Um, I say that because if you're a guy and you're at a urinal, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> but you got used to it. So when the building got hit, it was like a giant pendulum. It just went back and forth. It took the impact, but you literally felt like you were going to sway and fall out of the building on one side or the other. The only thought that went through my head, I was not married at that point, uh, but my mother would call me at 6.30 every morning and we would talk, and that particular day we were just too busy and didn't get a chance. All I thought was, man, I would have loved to have had the opportunity to say goodbye to my mother, because I didn't know if I was gonna get out. But fortunately, we kept going, and, and we did get to the eighth floor, which is the observatory deck, and we got down, and this is the last time I saw Rick. I saw him out of the corner of my eye because I was going down the escalator with a group of people, and I just heard on a megaphone, I heard singing. I didn't know what he was singing, but I heard singing, and I heard this is a great day to be an American. God bless you all. God bless America. And I knew that was him. And here's the difference. I was going out of the building. 
he's going back up. And he went back up in that building, and that was the last I ever saw him. There's no doubt in my mind, um, not only for myself, but for who I was entrusted to take care of in that day, I would not be sitting here in front of you. Um, and a lot of other people would not be here if it weren't for Rick and for his training. Throughout the day, and actually throughout the last couple of days, and the questions have all, a lot of them have been about how individually we carry ourselves, how we make a difference, how do we impact others for either those that we command or those with whom we are associated. The idea that one person can make a difference, we sometimes wonder about that. But there is no question here that one person made an incredible difference. The Rick Rescorla story unto itself is a firm example of how one person can make a difference. So let's go back a little bit about Rick Rescorla and, and the training. And my guess is, and from what I've read, not everybody was real happy with the fact that Rick uh, sort of beat him over the head about train. Now, for many of us, we've heard in, in the military, if you train like you fight, you'll fight like you've trained. Now, I'm going to assume that that's the lesson that Rick brought to Morgan Stanley. Oh, he scared the hell out of us in training. And, and in a way where you knew how he was, look, I didn't have the pleasure. I now subsequently, thanks to Susan, feel like I really knew him. But I didn't have the pleasure of knowing him socially. Um, but Rick wasn't there to make friends with you. Rick was there to save your life. And when you sat through training with Rick, oh, you paid attention, like I said before, believe me. Okay, I've got the attention span of a flea, and that's an insult to the flea. Okay, what I would say to you is, you paid attention to Rick because you had no other choice. He, he was going to make you pay attention, and his voice, his intelligence, his experience, you may not have known him from a hole in the wall, but the second the man opened his mouth, you knew this was somebody you're going to respect, and you knew that this was somebody you're going to listen to. And... We had several trainings. I mean, look, we would go to the training and we'd roll our eyes and be like, oh, man, we got to go through this again. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Thank God we did because the training sunk in. You could tell from the passion that he had. He was not going to let you get hurt. He was going to take it upon himself to make sure you listened to him and you understood exactly what he said. And you know what? When it clicked in, was absolutely when you needed it to. The stories we heard about, well, it took two hours to get down the stairwell after the bombing, coupled with, you know, hey, I was covered in soot and it was a real disaster. You coupled that with what Rick was telling you, which was like, you leave, you get out, you go. That's it. You start putting that stuff together and you hope that you never have to use it, right? But when the time came, it was automatic. And he really made a difference. Jill, you uh, said you, were, you, were, you saw that plane go in, you, you, things were happening around you, You're, you can't help but be scared to death because you don't know, and, and you took off. Kind of what happened next after that? You, you started to, to move away, you mentioned the truck with the loud AM radio yep. going on, but continue that story down. What sure. happened and, and did you get back with your other Morgan Stanley folks, and how did you come back together? Sure. So after listening to uh, the 80 AM radio, uh, and uh, it was confirmed that it was a terrorist attack, first thought into my mind was, where well, there's jet fuel. So there's a good chance that there's going to be an explosion or the buildings are going to uh, collapse. So <clears throat> at the time, everyone was trampling over everyone else and just trying to evacuate. So we started to head, head I, I didn't want to jump on a cab, uh, in a cab, I didn't want to get on the train, I just wanted to run as quickly as I could back to the hotel. Especially as a Florida, Florida young man, didn't really know the city that well. Um, I could almost say right now, looking back on it, I was probably terrified. And <clears throat> for a moment I started thinking about my family. I didn't have my cell phone which at the time was a flip phone. 
Remember those? Motorola. Uh, yeah, and a beeper. So um, decided to stop at a pay phone, uh, pay phone to, to call my, my family. And the line was really long. There's probably like 30 deep. So got there, uh, made the collect call, um, connected with my mother, and um, it, it was the best feeling ever. Cause, cause, so what happened was, uh, rewind a little bit, rewind the tape a little bit. So my, my mother's working that she owned her own um, business with my stepfather. And he runs in and goes, there was an attack at the World Trade Center. And I think that's where um, your son is. Stands up, goes over to the TV, and sees that the first tower is on fire. Picks up the phone, calls the local branch where I, I worked out of, which was in uh, Plantation, Florida. They get the manager on the phone, and they ask, she asks him, is he okay? I know he's in uh, the Twin Towers. He said, I know exactly where your son is. No need to worry. He's in the other building, right in the middle of the building. Perfectly safe. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Hangs up. A couple minutes later, the second plane went right through. So I was very happy to connect with her. Um, after that, I, I, I wished the person behind me good luck and just ran to uh, 55th in Lexington. And so got to the, uh, the hotel, which was uh, the Shelbourne Hotel at the time. And for the first time in my life, I saw more than 20 grown men crying hysterically. I'd never seen that in my life. Coming from a big city like Miami, where you're raised to be tough, resilient, uh, intestinal fortitude, all the core values that you're, you're taught about. And walking in there, that was another shock for me to see, at the time, 40, 50-year-olds just crying hysterically. And why? Because they didn't know whether they were going to make it out of the city that day. And all they wanted to do was to see their family. That's all they cared about. Billy, uh, what, what happened to you after you, you got a group out, you were outside, now what? Well, so we got outside, I had maybe about 10, 15 people that, was part, that were still with me, part of this group. So the first thing I did when I got out was there was a police officer standing there, and I asked him, I said, honestly, I said, I've got this group of people, you know, what do I do? And his exact reaction was, well, I would get out of downtown. He goes, we heard there's another plane coming. Oh my. Okay. So I turned around and said to the, to the people that I was with, we, we were actually in three different hotels because uh, it was a large class. So we had the South Gate, which is no longer there. I think it's the Hotel Penn now. But that was 33rd and 7th right across from Madison Square Garden. We had the East Gate, which I think was about four blocks away from that. And then to your point, we had the Shelburne, Shelburne. which was up uh, 55th and Lex. So what I said to everybody is I said, look, go back to the hotels. Go back to the, to the rooms, check in. We'll figure this out. Now, once I said that to them, because I'm not going to lie to any of you, there were three options that went off in my head. Option one, I lived across the street. Okay? I lived in Southgate uh, Hotel, or excuse me, Southgate Apartment Building, which was in Battery Park City. I could go back, grab a bottle of Grey Goose, hole up and watch ESPN for two hours until this blew over. That was option one. Option two, I could get on the West Side Highway, walk back to Yonkers, New York, about maybe seven or eight miles, um, and go be with my parents who were probably, you know, my father was in a wheelchair, he was incapacitated, and, and my mother was, was getting up there in years too. So put them at ease. Or I could do the right thing, which is you're supposed to be the manager, you're supposed to be the leader of this class. You go to the hotels, and you try to figure this out, because you're going to have a lot of scared people, me being one of them, and, you know, we've got to figure out what to do. So it didn't take long. Um, I chose option three, because it was really option one to me. And I started walking and going up. Now, similar to what Gio said, we had the StarTAC phones, which you guys are all too young for this, thank God, but 
It kind of looked like something out of Star Trek. We'd flip it over and it was a great little phone, but there was no cell service at all. Zip. You, you had a better chance of winning the lottery of getting a cell phone call to go through. So I knew I had to call my parents because similar story to him, you know, again, they were older and, you know, if I didn't let them know I was okay, I know my mother would, God forbid, probably get sick. Um, so I found the one pay phone, I think, where there wasn't a really long line. There was about three or four people online. And I called my mother and my mother sounded like death warmed over uh, when, when she answered the phone. But I assured her I was fine. I, I told her what my intentions were and what I was going to do. And then I just proceeded to keep walking. So I walked east because I wanted to get away from the smoke. So I ended up by Canal Street over in that area. And I remember looking up at the buildings at one point and I saw what I don't even know how to describe to you, but just black, um, like a black hole okay, that went you know, perpendicular from each side with smoke billowing out. And I was listening to chatter on the street, and people were like, oh, this is going to take forever to fix, and, you know, uh, probably be out of work for months. Nobody said the building was going to fall down, you know. Um, but a couple minutes after that, you felt the rumble. And I remember I ran under an awning, which was probably not that big. Okay, maybe a little tiny little piece of tin. That really would have saved my life. But I ran under it. And I just turned around and I looked, and you just saw the building come down. You couldn't believe what you saw. And you saw smoke billowing out and coming out. Anyway, I kept walking, ended up back at the hotel. Thank God the hotel was just amazing. They worked with me to, really for 11 hours, to try to just figure out, we had 276 people, who do we have left? And I kind of worked alone uh, for about seven or eight hours before other people came from my firm. I thought they were all dead, to be honest with you. But I started getting some additional help in. And I'm happy to say it took us four days, but we actually accounted for every single person. That's great. So I want you to think about that, what Rick did. We didn't lose one person. If I had lost one person and it was my training class, I don't think I ever would have forgiven myself. But thanks to Rick and what he taught us, what he taught me, Everybody survived. That's great. Susan, we're going to come back to you. How'd you hear? Did you have television, radio, phone call? Okay, so we left in the morning. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move you back up. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity to tell you this story, which is incredible. And once again, I tell all of you out there that Rick and I, we just thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you do, and God bless you all. Um, let me get back to the, to the Raptor Trust again. So there I am, and I'm, he's telling me about what to, what to do if it, it, you know, with, with me not being there, that he wanted this cage to, you know, with the, with, the, uh, with the birds in it. So I went home, and I wrote everything down that he asked me to do, and I even, I even had written on it, uh, if, I can read it if I can read it to you, um, if you have... I don't want to take up your time, but I, this, this is, these couple, last couple of things of his life were really important. Um, let's see, he was, um, okay, he, um, so I did what, I did what he said, I went, I went back and, and I, uh, Afterwards, I went over there to, he, let me, I'm so sorry, I'm trying to remember everything without crying, okay? Um, he, he, you know, I just, so anyway, he was saying to me about, the, about what he wanted at, at this place that was going to be actually where I would go to visit him, as I do now, okay? So, the, so what I had written down was exactly what he wanted me to say and to do. And it was really about, you know, him being, you know, even though he was born in England and his heart was, his heart was there, he was a true American citizen. And, and um, so anyway, one month later, uh, he, goes, he goes back and forth to England twice to say to his mother was not, not well. And the last time that he had gone over there, um, his childhood friend had put him on the train to go up to uh, London to go home. 
and um, he he said to uh, he he made sure that he went to the front front of the train, and he uh, his best friend was there, and he was saying goodbye to his best friend, and he put his fist up in the air, and in and in Cornish, he said goodbye to his country, not knowing that that would be the last time he would ever be there, because in one month from then he was dead. So he comes home and life goes on and he's still talking to me about this and then it gets closer and closer to 9-11 and that morning when he went out, it was a little bit different. I was always the first one up and giving him breakfast and he kind of was in a hurry and so forth. But when he got there, he always called me, which he did. And then, I don't know, it was about two hours later and the phone rang, it was his best friend down in Florida and he said, you have the television on? And I said, no, no. So I put it on and within 10 minutes, he called me and he said to me, if, if something happens to me, I want you to know you made my life. And I said, my God, you made my life. And so the next thing you know, about a half hour later, the building comes down and I'm watching it on the television and I went out of the house screaming. I mean, it was like something so incredible you can't even imagine. And it, it just, you know, when I look back on all these things, there, I had so many, mo so many things to tell you more about him here. But I, I think that um, it's harder and harder for me to talk about it, to tell you the truth. And I find myself crying a lot, but I am so blessed that, that God really gave me the best person ever at the end of my life. And, um, and every morning I talk to him, and um, I'm going to be up there soon, and I'm going to be having a happy time. So um, I just want to tell you that, it, it, you know, there was so much more, and I'm sorry that I kind of broke down inside, but that's it. But I do want to thank two people, and that is that after 9-11, I just, I just uh, was so upset for, for a very long time, but I decided I was going to make, I was going to decide, I was going to go to people and see what they thought about what happened on 9-11. And so um, I was on a train coming down from Boston ask, asking people, what did you think these uh, men were there, looked like they were in, you know, going to business, and they said, we don't care, all we want to do is make money. Then I decided to travel in different countries all over the world since I had been brought up and gone to school and in Europe and everything. And I went to Russia and I asked some of the little girls that were in dress shops, you know, what do you think about coming to America? And everybody, you know, were, were frightened, but I was trying to, you know, make them know that they had no reason to be that. Then I went to Germany and I went to a church where there was a beautiful uh, concert and afterwards, the woman that was in charge of it, you had to walk up like 50 steps to go up to the top of the stone church. And they said that on 9-11, that everyone in that, all the women in that village got on their knees and came up to the top of that church. So I just, it made me feel better to go and to talk to people, to go to schools. I've talked in high schools. I've done this you know, so many times because I don't want anyone to forget anything of what will happen because it will happen again. And so I was so depressed all those years. I mean, I'm still crying, okay? But two people saved my lives. And one of them was, was Billy, and the other one is Adam. Are you up there, up there, Adam? You stand up. They were, they were two people that, um, if you want to tell the story about how they did that. But I'm going to end with this, and then if they want to, you know, if you would like to get up and just t tell that part of it when I was doing But he, But here's the other thing. Um, I ha there was no body. I don't know if you know this. There was no body, okay? And the, and the people uh, in the, um, uh, the morgue kept calling me up saying, we're look you know, they're looking and everything, and people in, in there had, would, would call me and say, we haven't found anything yet. And then suddenly... They found something. There is no body. However, I, would, I think you're going to love this, okay? I think God did this. And that is that the thing that they found was his um, t t tarnished army card. How about that? And every day that he went to work, he always put his wallet in, in his desk. But this, this time, I think that he wanted 
he wanted it to be found, okay? Yeah. So I have that, and I actually do donated it to the, uh, I think, down to the museum down in Fort Benning, Georgia, where all of his memorabilia is in a, t in a, in a beautiful um, museum that I will be going down and seeing in the next couple of months. So anyway, there's also just the last thing is I raised money to put a statue of Rick up d down there with his, two of his best friends. And so um, the, the, one, the one half of it, it's huge. It's got him, and he's in his position with his gun. And then on the either side is not only, it's, not, it's a soldier, and it's, on the other side is it's 9-11. So anyway, I got completely off, but I can't <laughs> help it, OK? <laughs> Thank you. We were fortunate about three or four years ago to go through executive training at West Point. And uh, General Ken Thonsecker was my instructor, fabulous, one of the best people I've ever met in my life. And the training was just absolutely off the charts. But what they taught us in there, and I've thought about it, they taught us, and I'm, sure, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this terminology, is something called an after action review. You know, after something happens, you kind of look back on the plan that you had, you know, what went right, what went wrong. So when I do the after action review mentally, of what happened on 9-11. You saw the worst in humanity that day, by far, but you also saw the best. You saw people unite. You know, there's a saying from an old movie, which a lot of you probably won't know because you're too young, but it's called Wall Street. And one of the characters says, you know, when you stare into the abyss and you don't see anything staring back at you, that's when you find your character. And your character is what keeps you out of the abyss. So when I think back to that day, the character that people displayed, the unity, the, the ability to, to come together and work together was a lesson that I learned as a positive from that day. When you look at the sacrifice that Rick made, when you look at what he did for people, going back up into a building, when he knew that was certain death, that to me exemplified the power of the human spirit and the power of this country and the people in this country. So, I just wanted to share that with all of you and just always remember that. <laughs>